into um, the Word of God. Anyone ready for the Word of God this morning? Um, and, and so I just want to share about something, a topic that has been just stirring in my heart a little bit lately, and um, it is the F word. So turn to your neighbor and say, she's going to talk about the F word. And tell your other neighbor, say, it's forgiveness. Psych. You're like, you're about to yelp me. Just stop the yelp. It's forgiveness. It's an inside joke. Uh, forgiveness. And this is something that um, the Lord, you know, the Bible has so much to say when it comes to this area of forgiveness. And, um, you know, I, I have a desire and so does my husband, Jeremy. We have a desire that you would not just make it to heaven. And I think that's great that you're saved and you make it to heaven. But while we live on this earth, we have a desire that you live whole, you live healed, and you don't walk around with enemies all over. You don't have broken, fractured relationships everywhere you look, but that you can be healed from the inside out. And that healing is offered to each and every one of you today. And that is through Jesus Christ. Amen. And so this is, this is what can shackle us though. Because if I were the enemy, the way I would stop you from walking into your destiny is to keep you so bound up in your fence, so bound up in your anger and in your rage that you cannot walk into the fullness of what God has for you. So we are serving an eviction notice on the enemy in us that says I need to hold this today and we're kicking that lie out and we're saying guess what today I know and I'm gonna as I share I pray that there's a release in you that understands forgiveness has nothing to do with them and everything to do with you forgiveness is not for them it is for you it cuts the cord between you and them forgiveness is not acting like it never happened that's lying it's saying this pain is not going to control me any longer. I'm not living hostage. I'm not going to be held in prison to this pain. And, and, you know, I found, at least for me, through, you know, my 42 years of life, I'm so young still, right? Am I young? Please tell me. Anyone in their 40s and you're happy about it, not depressed, come on. We're happy in 40. Come on. Any over 40. Let me just say over 40s. Come on. We're getting. Yes. Thank you. We're more alive and more on fire than we were when we were young. Because when the longer you live for Jesus, you shouldn't grow more apathetic. You should grow more on fire for God. Come on. The old people that get up in the front. I love them. Anyway, as I've grown my fortitude years of living, reading the word, I found that your promotability is directly connected to your forgivability. Your promotability is connected to your forgivability. I found it, I've seen it. You may not see the quote in the Bible, but I just learned this. I've just, I've just seen it throughout my life. And in the only place that God commands a blessing in your life is where it comes to how you handle forgiveness. How you handle forgiveness is, and if you do it the right way, the Bible says in Psalm 133, that he commands a blessing over you. So my heart is that you would be blessed, that it would lift the lid in your life and the things that have been stopped up and been clogged up because of all this pain would just be lifted this morning and that you would walk out a little bit lighter, a little bit more free, a little bit more, more. you know, you're, you're just gonna feel a sense of this heaviness lifted. Does that sound good this morning? Not because of me, but because of Jesus. How many know he can do that? Can anyone say amen? How many of us experienced the healing of God? Can I say here an amen? Amen. So we're going to go into this, this um, parable. And I just want to read it to you just to give you a little context as we get into this. Anyone brought your, your Bibles today? Okay, nobody. Perfect. You got to figure out, am I a cult leader or not? You know? No. 
Oh wait, that was too far. You guys are, Matthew 18, (laughs) parable of the unforgiving servant. It says this, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Oh, isn't this funny because He's thinking he's doing good. He's like, that's your perfect number, Jesus, seven times, right? Isn't that it? You know, and, and you know, actually the Jewish law said that you had to forgive three times. So he's thinking he's going above and beyond and going seven times, right? And, and it says, Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children, all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But then that servant went out. He found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. That's a little bit similar to a couple of scriptures ago where he was in. And it says, but he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Verse 35, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless, everyone say unless. Say that again, say unless. Unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So this morning, I have a message that's called prison break, prison break. And I feel that there is some people in this room that are getting ready to break out of a prison that they have been in for years. I'm telling you, if you've come today, it is not too late. There's healing afforded to you today. So I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, there is about to be a prison break. Come on, turn to two more people. There's about to be a prison break. Come on, say it again. There's about to be a prison break. Say it like you believe it. There is about to be a prison break. Come on, we're going to break every cycle. We're going to break out of our pain. We're not going to be hooked on our pain. We're getting up out of the seat of the victim. We're not going to cry over it any longer. We cried for long enough. It's stolen from our life. It's getting stolen years of our life and minutes of our life that we could be putting energy into our future. And I'm done. I'm ready to break out of that prison. Are you ready this morning? Jesus. Can we lift up our hands in this house today? Lord Jesus, we come to you in the posture. We're ready for whatever you have to say, whatever you want to do. Lord, speak. We are listening. Holy Spirit, speak. We are listening. We ask right now that you would just do a deep work. I might be speaking, but Holy Spirit, you're going to do a whole nother sermon as I'm speaking. And I thank you that there's not going to just be information given today but it would breathe transformation into our hearts, not just for a day, but for a lifetime, that you're gonna mend relationships, you're gonna heal hearts today. Lord, you're gonna heal those that have been tormented in their minds. And Lord Jesus, we are so thankful for what you've done. We thank you also, God, for the forgiveness that you have so given us. We are so blessed. We are so grateful this morning. We should not even be here today if it were not for you, Holy Spirit. We come to you with thankful, grateful hearts today. 
And we say thank you, Jesus, for your love and your mercy. In Jesus' name. And everyone says amen, amen, amen. Prison break, prison break. You know, I, I wanted to share about this because I think it's very easy uh, to act like we have got it all together, especially in church. I mean, I think Hollywood doesn't have the best, best actors. I think churches do. <laughs> you know, we're smiling. This is my brother. This is my sister in God. You know, and, you know, we hate them, but we're smiling. And, you know, and we talk really bad about them, but then we're just hugging on them. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, and I just want to help you this morning because I'm this way. I, I, I sometimes like, you know, don't, that's not message isn't for me. You know, I, I love everyone and, you know, but, but really if we dig down deep, I mean, if you can, if you can walk into a room and you see that person and it can change your attitude, I believe that's unforgiveness. If you can walk into a room, whoever you see, if you see that person and it can shift your heart and it can disrupt your peace, that's unforgiveness. If, if it can disrupt your heart and disrupt your attitude when you see that person, I think that person has become your master. And, and I think if somebody can do that to me, I think that is too much power to give to someone else. The Bible says this, be angry and sin not. So turn to your neighbor and say, God told you to be angry because I don't want to preach to you. Don't be angry. Stop being angry. No, 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 no. God gives us an emotion of anger that I think is actually good to have anger. I think anger shows you when somebody's crossing the line with you, that's moving past where they should or saying things that are hurting you. How do you know without having that mechanism of fight or flight or your adrenals to know that person has gone too far? They've crossed the line right here or they, this is my boundary right here. I made some boundaries and healthy boundaries and they crossed those. So anger can be a healthy thing, but the Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. So you can have anger, but friends, if the anger stays, that's when it becomes sin. When the anger stays, the Bible says that anger rests in the bosom of fools. The Bible says if you have anger that stays, you are being foolish because anger is destructive. Anger is like a cancer and anger will grow and it will eat away at who you are. Have anyone experienced that before? It eats away at your peace. It steals your joy. It steals your energy. So now I have no energy for tomorrow. In fact, I know church, I cannot be a good wife, a good mom, a good leader if I am harboring anger in my heart because you have to have put energy into it to maintain it. Anger has to be fed. So you have to feed it with your actions. You're feeding it with your thoughts. You're feeding it with, by telling somebody else about it. You're feeding by telling this person about it. And you keep having it and you're giving it so much energy because you have to give that energy. You have no energy to put into creativity, to put into your future, to put into your destiny, to put into your dreams. Because what the anger is, is what has happened. And when God gives you a promise, it's what's going to happen. So if you're looking at what has happened for so long. You have no energy to look into what is going to happen and the purposes and the future God has for you. And the enemy of our souls is disrupting our lives with this. It is distracting us. The drama it is, it, it is changing who we are. We used to be a soft-hearted, kind person. All of a sudden, we become more abrasive. We have some walls up. It's locking us out of the still waters that God has promised for us. It's locking out of peace. It is robbing you, friends. It's robbing you of your joy. It's robbing you of what's in front of you because you're fueling your history at the expense of your destiny. And here we are, but listen. Listen. We're about to break the cycle today. We're about to break the cycle. Come on, tell your neighbor, I'm ready to break this cycle. Come on, say it with confidence, I'm ready to break the cycle. I'm ready to let this go. I'm ready for a prison break. I wanna break out of what they did to me. Was it hard and was it bad? Yes. I don't wanna diminish pain today. In fact, let me say this, when this happened to you, 
God was grieved. He wasn't happy about this. It is a sin of nature of humans that when the sin came in the world, he was grieved when this happened to you. He did not want it to happen to you. He loves you. And so listen, this is not God that did this to you. This is sin. But listen, we cannot let this person live rent free in our minds any longer. They've taken too much square footage. They've taken too much of my energy. I need this energy to think up new ideas. I need this energy to help other people. I need this energy because I need to be healed because I need to help bring healing to other people. And why does a world need us to go have Jesus, but look at all my wounds. Look at how much hurt I have. We have have to be healed those wounds have to move to scars so we could tell a hurting world I know what it's like to hurt but also I know what it's like to be healed we need a prison break today so I want to get into this message today you know I found that this this thing is that unaddressed hurt turns to hate and and hate we think in the strongest, craziest sense when we think of the word hate, but I really wanna break it down because in the Greek, hate means loveless. So really hate is just being devoid of love. Um, I just began to think as I was writing the sermon is who's the first person I hated? And there was a person when I was in elementary school, I had a bully and her name was Hannah. It's okay, I'm totally healed from it, y'all can laugh. I, I, had, I had, a. has anyone had a, bully growing up? Yes, we're all gonna get healed today. This is good, this is great. All of us have had a bully. Anyone has been the bully? Okay, we're, we're gonna, it's, we're coming back at you now. Today. Everyone's like not raising their hand. I had a bully, this girl, her name was Hannah and she was just really tall and she was just, because I was, I'm very petite and little so I just remember she was just bigger than me and she was so mean to me and you know, I, I was like the, you know, the good girl, I was teacher's pet. You know, I always wanted to do the right thing. And I was, um, you know, I called goody two shoes. You know, I was that, that kid in school. My, my parents uh, raised me in a fishbowl and they, they raised me like not listening to anything. Dumb and Dumber I got grounded for, which was a total abomination because Dumb and Dumber is one of the greatest movies of all time. Do not argue with me right now. That is my favorite movie. And so they, I got grounded, so I went on a spree to watch it a lot. And so they would hook up um, a, a cuss-free box. Um, I don't know if y'all remember those or they sell them anymore. But it's the best thing that's ever happened to me because I went from not being able to watch any movies because then now I could watch almost any movie that had any cussing in it because it was the cuss-free box. It freed every movie of all the bad words. And so we got, we would be binge washed like anything and everything. My eyes were open and then it would cut out the word and it wouldn't even be a curse word. It would be like, you know, uh, a butt. So it would say, you know, kick, kick your toe. It wouldn't even show me the butt word. So, you know, guys, my parents did not prepare me for adulthood. Let me just tell you that. So I came to LA and I was like, what's happening to me? And so, thank you, Jesus. And so, yeah, my husband's like, you are book smart, I am street smart. So let me help you, honey, let me help you. <laughs> so I, I remember she one day, um, she was walking with me and she grabbed me. She picked me up and she threw me, there was like this huge mud puddle, she threw me in a mud puddle. Everyone say all, one, two, three. I'm totally healed from it now. I can talk about it and testify. So she threw me in the mud puddle I just got up and I, I remember going to my dad's office. I was at the school. My dad has a little school that was connected and I, he has office. He said, you can come in anytime you want. It doesn't even matter if I'm in a meeting, just barge in. I barged in, I had mud all over me. He was like, what's happening? And so I went and sat on his lap and he's, he taught me something at a very young age. He said, you know, when I would tell him about people that hurt me, he would have me pray for them. And so I just found that, you know, something would change in me when I would pray. Uh, I would just, you know, taking pain caused by people to God in prayer will always change your perspective. I'll say that again. Taking pain caused by people to God in prayer will always change your perspective. And it just, my heart started changing towards her. I began to think, is there more? There's probably more to the story than what I'm seeing. And I began to kind of have more compassion. What was funny is a couple years ago, um, she was actually in a meeting where I was preaching. 
Hannah was sitting in the room and at the end of that meeting, she actually walked up and she was bawling, crying. And she began to tell me all the, it started making sense. See, the pain in your behavior doesn't excuse your behavior, but it does explain your behavior. And so when she began to share this with me, she was crying. I just went through a dysfunctional home and there was a lot of healing that took place. And I hugged her and I just found that if you do not heal what hurts you, you will bleed on those who never cut you. And that was what was happening. She was just bleeding on me. It wasn't that I was doing anything, but that she wasn't getting healing. So she was just bleeding on everyone else. Isn't that what happens with us even into adulthood? Is really we're just bleeding on everyone else. They necessarily didn't do anything wrong. They were just touching and hitting triggers and hitting trauma and hitting areas. It's like when we have a bunch of uh, 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 arrows stuck in us, wounds and different words and different things that, that people said in childhood or growing up and they're just wounds and we keep saying, we're not gonna forgive, I'm not gonna forgive, I'm gonna hold on to this, I'm gonna hold on, I'm gonna be the strong person, I'm gonna be the tough person. And what's happening all through life, your spouse is hitting the arrows and it's about a stupid dishwasher problem. God, and driving problem. And my husband isn't a good driver. Let me tell you that. That has nothing to do with my sermon, but I do forgive him for not driving good. I'm the better driver. But this is the thing, they're stupid, petty things. I shouldn't even get irritated. But I get so mad. And they'll tell me, there must be some wound there, honey. I'm like, shut up, there's no wound there. You're the wound. You know? We'll do couples therapy after this. <laughs> so it's just, you know, there, there's so much that we, uh, even in life, we're, we're we're cutting people off, we're hurting people because we've been wounded, not from them, but from the past. That's just why it's so important because we, don't, we need to stop bleeding out on our spouses, bleeding out on our dating relationships, on our friendships. Where we are, now we're, we're the person that everyone's saying, get away from them, don't, don't talk to them, you know? And now we have created this place where people are scared to talk to us. People are scared. Is, is this making sense this morning? I've been that person. So, so I want to go into this parable a little bit this morning. Oh gosh, 20 minutes. Lord, multiply the time in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to go back to this parable. Thank you for agreeing with me, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go back. So let's go to verse 23. Matthew 18, 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Now, I want you to know that a parable, God speaks in terms of parables because he wants to use natural things many times to explain supernatural things. And he wants to use relatable things to explain unexplainable things. So this is what he's trying to break it down. Everyone say, let's break this down. So the kingdom of God, kingdom is God's way of doing things. This is God's way. We have a way, we wanna do things, but we are in this room because we wanna learn God's way of doing things. And so this is, he's going, this is how I operate. I want you to come into this story. And he's saying the master is God and the servant is you and I. And he says they, that the, the guy came to settle accounts. So one day we will go before the judgment seat of Christ and we will have to settle accounts. So here he brings it up to verse 24. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and children, all that he had be sold to repay the debt. So Jesus is teaching, he's saying, this servant owes 10,000 bags of gold. The people listening to this parable would have had been very shocked because this is an absurd amount of money. One bag of gold, was equivalent to a salary of one year. So if you bring it to today, let's say that was $40,000 a year you make. This means that is $400 billion. This servant owed the master $400 billion. No one could get him out of this mess. Elon Musk does, has pennies. Bezos has pennies compared, they, no one can do it. And this is where we miss it because listen, what earthly king would do that? What earthly king could 
lend out $400 billion. But guess what? We don't have an earthly king. We have a heavenly king. And this heavenly king says, I'm not going to just lend you $400 billion. I'm going to give you life. I'm handing you life. Here you go. You can have it. Here's your license to live. He is a God of mercy. So I didn't deserve it, but he gave me life. But then there's a debt. There's a debt. Because we disobeyed, there is a debt called sin. So Romans says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that's the mercy, the life. But then, here we go, he's a just God. The wages of sin are death. I deserve Death, when I go to Jesus and we sit on cats, I can't go, hey, I, I, I went to X18 a lot and I, I went to church consistently and I did this and this and this. I, there is nothing I could do to pay that debt. Are you catching this today? The wages of my sin, the payment for what I had done was death. We need a savior. We needed a savior. So here we go. We're going to go to verse able to pet the verse 25 since he was not able to pay the master ordered he and his wife his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt listen everything that you do doesn't only affect you it affects people all around you what happened to him now his wife was affected his kids were affected by this decision 26 at this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I'll pay back everything. Please, I'm so sorry. I'll do it. I don't want you to sell my, my family into slavery. Please, I'm sorry. We, I repent. You know, this is what he's doing. And the servant's master took pity on him. Come on. He canceled the debt, and he let him go. Repentance leads to God's forgiveness in the kingdom. That's good news for us today because many of us need God's forgiveness. <laughs> Come on, when we ask for God's forgiveness, he gives it to us. This is the gift of God. He goes, I'm going to forgive. What do you do, fearless, when you have been forgiven of a $400 billion debt? What do you do? How do you celebrate when you come into this room and you get the realization that I should not have life? I should have paid a big wage called death. But he said, I became sin and I went on the cross and I died as you. I became sin. He who knew no sin, I canceled your $400 billion debt and now I have Oh, I feel like dancing. Why is this girl, this blonde girl so crazy? Because I have been forgiven of a debt I could have never touched or never paid. And I'm grateful. And if he never did one more thing for me, that's okay. He has done enough for me to get on my feet and give a shout and give a thank you. Oh, I feel a thank you inside my spirit. I feel a thank you in my heart that says, God, I don't deserve it, but you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. This is what he did. He said, I cancel the debt. I cancel the debt. But when that servant went out, listen to this. But when we went out and we leave this room and Monday happens, we start going to work. We live our life. He found one of his homies who owed him a hundred silver coins. I don't know. Maybe that's any mathematicians here. 40 bucks. I mean, this is nothing compared to what he was forgiven of. He grabbed him, began to choke him. Pay back what you owe, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees, begged him. Oh, this sounds familiar. Be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. The man, are you catching this? The man who just got canceled a debt of $400 billion, he turns and was forgiven. And now there's a man that owes him 40 bucks. He chokes him and says, no, you're not forgiven. 
The Bible says he threw him in prison until he could pay the debt. And the human condition is marked by this sentiment. Mercy for me, justice for you. Mercy for me, justice for you. We go to God and we receive his forgiveness. We receive his mercy, right? But then we turn around and we justify and give reasons for why that wound was too deep and I cannot give that forgiveness and mercy to someone else. Mercy for me, justice for you. The other day we got in the car, I go, kids, we're going to ice cream, yay, we're going to ice cream. But if you act like a little demon, you are not getting the ice cream, <laughs> you're not. So shut your mouths, we're gonna go and then we're gonna be happy, put a smile on. So we got in the car, they're all in there and then like 30 seconds later, Brave says something to Lyric, triggers her, you know, makes her mad. All right, Brave, you don't get ice cream. No, mom, please, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, no, okay, okay, Brave, you can have, I'll give you a chance. Like, I forgive you, you're gonna have another chance, you can have ice cream. Two minutes later, Lyric does the same thing. She just says something that gets under his skin because she was mad, he did something to her. And so she says something back and he goes, look, she just said that. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't get ice cream. Look at what she, she doesn't get ice cream. I'm like, brave, just two seconds ago, I just forgave you. It lets you say you can have, isn't that funny? This is the human condition, mercy for me, Justice for you. Uh, a week ago, I, I was in the car with my little angel arrow and we were just driving so beautifully. I was texting away and all of a sudden I saw police lights behind me. And I don't know if you're like me, but it elicits tears. It just, it, I don't know, maybe there's trauma there. I don't know. But I just started like, no Lord. And then you go to God, you're like, God, please get me out of this. You know, give, let me, you know, give me grace. And so I'm praying all this, Lord, what did I do? What did I do? I don't have drugs in my car, that's for sure. And you know, I'm going through all the bad things I could do and I have my registration tags. And so he, he, he says, hey, ma'am, is this an emergency while you're texting? And I'm like, do I lie? Because really, if I say it's an emergency, I'll get out. So like, no, I'm, okay, I'm gonna be honest with you, officer. I was, it was not an emergency. It was not an emergency. So because I just was honest with you, would you, you know? And he's just staring at me. So then I was like, that's not working. And then I was already like crying. So I was like, please officer, I start crying. Errol starts crying. It was just a circus in the room. It was a whole circus. He was confused what was happening. I was like, you know, a train wreck. And so he, you know, he said, I can't forgive you this. You know, I had a bunch of other people right before you that all did the same thing and they all got tickets. I gave them tickets. And immediately in my heart, I thought those per people deserve the ticket. And I said, I don't deserve this ticket officer. I gave all the ways. I don't deserve the ticket. I have a clean record. Look at my record officer. I've not done any DUIs. I have been good. I'm clean at my record. I'm, I'm drug free. You know, I'm not carrying any, you know, I'm just, God, please help me. And I was crying and, and I thought, isn't this so true of us in our nature? Mercy for me. And if anyone wants to like pay that ticket, it is $335. <laughs> Yes, I know. This is not part of my story. That's actually the second one. And I called Jeremy. <laughs> Jeremy's not here. He's sick at home. <laughs> Shut it. Whoever said that is kicked out of service right now. <laughs> what was I going to say? It's my second one. I don't remember what I was going to say about that. Like, I need forgiveness. Lord Jesus, that's it. I don't know. Oh, it was so good. What's I gonna tell you, huh? No, I wasn't gonna get spiritual with it. It was gonna be funny. <laughs> I missed the funny part. <laughs> anyway, I'm not doing good with my driving, actually. Um, you know what, honey, I take that back. Am I talking to you? You know what, you, you are a little bit of a better driver. That's, oh, oh, I had no compassion from Jeremy. This is not funny, actually. He, he just is like, I was like, look, can you believe? He goes, I think the Lord's trying to tell you something. <laughs> like, all right. I don't use the D word, but it's divorce, no. <laughs> okay, all right, so isn't this funny that we, we, we say, put that man in jail, he deserves justice for what he did, 
But isn't that so funny how we have spiritual amnesia? And just a couple scriptures before that, that same man was just forgiven of his $400 billion debt when he got on his knees. But yet we are so good at keeping score for them. We're so good at seeing the issue in them. We're so good at seeing the problem in them. And we are so blind to the sin in me. I'm so oblivious sometimes to the sin in me. And we are looking through life with a scoreboard mentality, keeping score and seeing how many times they've hurt me. Now they don't deserve that forgiveness. But I have to realize that it was me who put Jesus on the cross. It was my sin that put Jesus on the cross. It was me that needed his mercy. It was me that needed his forgiveness. And he gave it to me. And so Jesus, I've received this forgiveness. Thank God he doesn't keep score. Come on, anyone thankful he doesn't keep count. Thank you, Lord. He says, I forgive you, and it goes as far as the east is from the west. I don't even remember it. How many have said, you know, God, you know, some people go, hey, Christy, how many times do I have to forgive? Well, let me ask you, how many times do you want Jesus to forgive you? How, how many have been forgiven 20 times by God? 50 times? 100 times? <laughs> like, thank God. I killed the person last week. Thank God. <laughs> you know, we, we've been forgiven. And how many say we've lost count? Come on. Then why are we keeping score? Why are we keeping score? Forgiveness is not keeping score. It's about learning to lose count. Stop keeping score. Let's learn how to lose count. And listen, this is what happened. As we go along in this story, when this other servants, verse 31, saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Verse 32, then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow? This is Jesus. Just picture this master's Jesus. Shouldn't have you had mercy on that person just as I had on you? Yeah. In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he had owed. And Jesus is giving us a clear picture that when you hold unforgiveness in your heart, you have made a prison for yourself. Hate is a gate. And it starts by trying to keep people out of our life because they hurt me. What they said was so, it cut you so deep. And what we find out is as we're trying to keep people out, we have locked ourselves in a prison just like that man was put in a prison. Jesus is trying to say, this is a picture of when you do not extend the forgiveness that I have given to you, you find yourself in a dark, cold, dank prison of your pain. And I'm held hostage to my pain. I'm held hostage. I'm recycling the hurt. I've recycled it long enough. I'm sitting as a victim of my pain. I'm sitting in the seat. He lied to me. I've been fooled. The enemy tricked me. He told me that 
if I, if I hold on forgiveness, then I will be the bigger person. I'm going to be better. I'm going to have the upper hand, all these things. I'm going to shock. And look at what the enemy did. He was lying, manipulating me. It sounds like in the Garden of Eden, when I go flashbacks, where the serpent began to give the woman the, the, the bite of the apple and say, hey, I'm going to deceive you and tell you this is going to be better if you do this. But listen, what happened? She bit the apple and then it was all over. And listen, here we are. We take a bite of the bitterness. Take a bite. We say, this is it. And we digest it into our system, our spiritual system. And we are wondering why we are so unhappy and depressed and we don't have close, deep connection and friendship because we push so many people out. Guarding your heart. You said, I'm guarding my heart. Guarding your heart is not trying to keep everyone out that has the potential to break it. Guarding your heart is keeping everything out that has the potential to harden it. Guarding your heart from unforgiveness. Guard your heart from anger. Guard your heart from offense. Guard your heart from resentment. Guard your heart from bitterness. Come on, church. Guard your heart from these things. But listen, I don't have to live here. Isn't that the good news today? Is I don't have to live in this cell any longer. I do not have to live in a prison of my pain any longer. Guess what? Today, I am declaring this is going to be a day that we have a prison break. We break out of the prison that we have anyone with me are you ready to let it go are you ready to let it go break it we're breaking the cycle today I'm tired of living like this I'm tired of the enemy tormenting me I'm tired of him coming against me and telling me I'd be better off I'm tired of it and we have to get sick and tired because listen church Forgiveness is not saying it never, acting like it never happened. That's lying. Forgiveness is saying this pain will not control me anymore. Unforgiveness, when you choose that, it is like me drinking the poison and waiting on you to die. Forgiveness never excuses their behavior. It says that behavior will not destroy my heart. Amen. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So you trying to get revenge is maybe stopping the intervention of God. Let him intervene, but you're kind of in the way. How many know that it's a lot better in God's hands than mine. What a beautiful spirit that's in this house today. I do believe that you are catching this today. This is what I prayed for. Um, and I just wanna, I'm just gonna close with this and we're gonna have just a time of healing. I love this service is, you know, if you have to leave, you can, but at the altar, there's moments where you could just linger and stay and our prayer team will be here to just pray with you through this because there is a lot of deep pain in this room. There's a lot of deep hurt and, and, and that's okay to process with someone. But I do know this, because some of you are going, I'll wait till I feel that you know feeling from the Lord. No, 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 he already commanded it. He's already forgiven us. So, so human forgiveness is dependent on divine forgiveness. In other words, when you have gotten divine forgiveness from the Lord, that's how I am able to forgive. If we haven't recognized the weight of our own sin and repented, we are not able to really extend that because we haven't captured the weight of our sin. So when we receive that, we go, oh, I'm humbled. This is I, my sin put you on the cross. And we receive that mercy. I have the strength to now give that mercy now to someone else. And so, so my, my dad, I'll end with this. My dad was sitting me down the other day and he said, I was just with him in, in his house. And he said, I just haven't told you a story about your childhood. And um, he said, your grandma and grandpa, I called them mama and papa. 
he, it was his parents. He said there was a moment in time where we were praying for my sister. He's talking his sister. So my Aunt Linda, she had ovarian cancer. We were praying. My dad's a pastor still at that time when I was younger. And my dad was like, you know, she got cancer, ovarian cancer. My dad said, no, God's going to heal her. Well, you know, we prayed and, and she, she didn't get healed and she's in heaven. You know, sometimes God heals us on this earth and sometimes God heals us in heaven. And you know, I don't have all the answers to you. I would love to say I do, but I don't have all the answers, but it was a painful time. And so they, they just kind of came against our family. Like, Your God is not real. I can't believe you let this happen. And, and the fact that he was in ministry, his parents are not saved. So, you know, they decided to disown my dad and disown my family. He said, I don't know if you know that. He, my parents didn't talk to us for a season. They were in the same city, they didn't call. Like, and my dad said, we'd send them Christmas gifts and they just return them back to us at the door. And he said, you know, every year, you know how you kept getting, because I said, I kept getting gifts from mom and papa. He goes, well, you weren't really getting gifts from them. He goes, I, I was actually buying gifts with my money and putting on the tag mom and papa so they wouldn't know that you were not getting gifts from them. I didn't want you to feel that hurt and that pain and rejection. And so I was listening to my dad and I thought, man, what rejection, pain that must have felt like to have your own mom and dad say they're not, you're not my own anymore. Like I'm gonna treat you that way. He said a couple years later though, something happened where I was in the airport and the Holy Spirit stopped me. I wasn't even thinking about the situation. And the Holy Spirit stopped me and said, are you really going to allow yourself to harbor this pain and unforgiveness and let them die with that in your heart? How much have I forgiven you, Glenn? This is my dad's telling me. How much, the Holy Spirit was telling him this in the airport. Do you know how much I have forgiven you of? And he said in that moment, like the Holy Spirit just really came over him. He had to kind of step to the side in the airport and he started mending um, things. He started forgiving. He, you know, this is the thing. Some of you are going, I'm waiting for an apology. You might be waiting for the rest of your life. You have to learn to forgive even without an apology. That's for some of you in this room. And, and so, so he, 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 what's the cool story is that um, because of this healing that took place and my dad forgave, before they passed away, he was able to sit at the dining room table at our house and he was able to lead my grandma and grandpa to the Lord. And so they got saved and gave their lives to the Lord. And so I just, I share that story. I think just to share with you the power of forgiveness, not only that, but just that I know that there is some heaviness and pain in our hearts. And, and so forgiveness has nothing to do with like saying that was small or that was, no, it was a big deal. What, 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 what they did was a big deal. What your spouse said, that's a big deal. But I know this pain is not going to help you. It's just gonna be a cancer to your spiritual system. And me as a spiritual mother of the house and Pastor Jeremy, we want you to live whole. We want you to live healed. We don't want you to live in this jail cell that you've made for yourself called unforgiveness. But today the good news is you can break out of that cell. <laughs> Isn't that great news? Come on, fearless, you can break out, break out, break out today, break out, let it go. Let it go. Pull out the arrows. Pull out the words. Pull out what they didn't do. Pull out what they failed to say. Pull out things that they did. Pull out the rejection. Oh, I know they disappointed you. I know there's been broken promises. I know there's been unmet expectations. But I know that God wants to touch you today. And there can be a prison break today. We can break the cycle for my future and my children's children. They don't have to go through this. They don't have to see me hold on forgiveness. I want them to see a model of somebody that is open arms like Jesus because Lord knows I didn't deserve it. They don't deserve it. Well, I didn't deserve it either, but Jesus so gave me his forgiveness and love and he loves me just like this. Whatever I thought about and whatever I did, he still loves me today. Thank you, Jesus. So can we stand to our feet?
And in this beautiful spirit, let's just begin to thank him, first of all, for his forgiveness. And if you need to be forgiven, there's something, hey, that's the beauty of the cross. Let's just begin to ask God's forgiveness right now. Close your eyes all over this place. We're just gonna receive that because that gives you that mercy, divine forgiveness, will allow you the strength to forgive in just a couple moments. Let's just lift up our hands and so just say, God, can you forgive me for this? In that moment, he forgives. That moment, he forgives. Just, li- just the weight of your sin is gonna just lift. He took the weight of sin. Thank you, Jesus. And now we're gonna just move into this. If you need to forgive. Actually, let's do this. If you need to forgive yourself right now, there's a lot of you in this room that maybe it's not another person you need to forgive, but you have a hard time forgiving yourself. God already forgave you, but you are holding yourself hostage. You are been so hard on yourself. There's so much shame. And I'm gonna just pray that shame off. If that's you, can you lift up your hands? Lift up your hands. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. So many of you, so many of you. Say, dear Jesus, say this. I choose to forgive myself. And I want you to tell God what it's for. Just just begin to release that to, to God. Just begin to release it to God. Give it to God. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Just let it go. Just let some of that go. That shame go in Jesus' name. Condemnation go in Jesus' name. Break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. This is the last thing I want to do. And there is a sticky note under your chair. And if you can get down there, grab that and grab a pen. And what I'm gonna have you do, church, is write down all the names of those that you need to forgive. And this is not gonna be easy by any sense, but we're gonna make a decision this morning to do this. Grab, yes, it's gonna take some aerobics here. If you have bad knees, ask your neighbor to help you. And you can grab a pen right there. And what I want you to do before you start, this is gonna be a powerful moment, so I just want you to hear me. Please no one leaving. This is, this is why I preach this message today. I want you to grab that paper, write down all the names. When you are done, it doesn't, you don't have to wait for a certain moment up here. When you are done, I want you to crumble that paper up and I want you to come to this altar, run to the altar, bring it to the altar, and you do not have to go back to church. You could stay and linger and worship God. There is going to be a supernatural release in this moment, a release of a lot of heaviness. So church, we're gonna sing. I'm gonna have you start. You're gonna write the names, crumble them up, Bring him to the altar, and I'm going to pray with you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Fearless Online Church, man, what an amazing day so far. Right now is an opportunity for us to give back. We've been receiving so much. I, I don't know about you, but I've been blessed from what's going on in this stream and what God is doing in this church. Proverbs 19:17 says this, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and He, the Lord, will repay him for his deeds. This church is all about reaching the needs of our city and cities worldwide. In fact, last year alone, we were able to pass out 2.2 million pounds of food. Come on, somebody, that's a lot of food. We, We gave out food and we were able to pray for every single person. We also washed their cars, pretty much the modern day version of washing someone's feet. Man, what an awesome experience that we've got to have through generous givers just like you. You may not be able to be here on ground zero level, feeding people, clothing people, loving on people, but you sure can be a part of this by giving your finances and lending in a sense to the Lord. And we know that you can't outgive God. I've found over 41 years of life that no matter how much I give to the Lord, He always gives back. He gives back so much more, no matter how much I release. I really believe that the spirit of generosity is alive in our generation. We need to meet people's physical needs so they'll open their hearts so God can meet their spiritual need. Would you help us do that? We wanna give out more clothing. We wanna give out more food. We wanna touch thousands more people. In fact, this year, I'm believing to give out four million pounds of food. Would you step out in faith with us? 
Would you become a partner today? Everything in life to get anywhere really takes partnership. Every one of us are here because of partnership. Life happens because of partnership. I have a dream that we would reach people's physical need to give them a spiritual truth. Who Jesus is, who Jesus wants to be in their life, that love that we so boldly profess as Christians. Would you pray today about your gift, whatever size, large or small, that you're gonna partner with us once a month to see God do something incredible in a city. You can sign up for Fearless Partners today. Why wait another day? Let's be generous like our God and watch that generous God while we bless others continue to fill our, our vats, our barns, our, our dream, our business, our family fuller than we ever could have ourselves. God bless you as you give today. Let me pray over your giving as I believe people are moved today to become generous and partner with the Fearless Partners. Jesus, we pray over this giving. We pray over these people that are gonna sow into this ministry. We, we say right now, God, Lord, as we lend to the poor, as we help those in need, Lord, that you would help those that are giving. In Jesus' name, 